Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, as Hannah just said, we've just completed our week of prayer. And um, I just want to thank you, everybody who has joined in, in covering every hour slot this week so we can just cover the entire week in prayer. And I cannot wait to hear the stories and, and, and testimonies of what happens as the fruit of that, the impact of that. And today, to complete our prayer week, then kicking off with them, um, finishing off with Kingdom Come tonight. To complete today, to celebrate, we are in week three of our Bible series, working through the book of Ephesians in the Bible. And today is Ephesians 3. And very appropriately, it is a prayer. It is like God knew or something. Actually, the second half of Ephesians is a prayer. And that's what um, of Ephesians 3 is a prayer. And that is what we are going to focus on today. So it's a prayer in a letter written by Paul to these Christians in Ephesus. Um, and this, this letter is sent to these relatively new Christians, um, these followers of Jesus there who are trying to make their way in a culture that is very not like Jesus. Uh, they're immersed in this culture of empty promises of where to find life and hope and life in all its fullness. They're in this culture of idols and striving to appease these idols. And it was risky to be a Christian there in Ephesus. Like, like there are riots recorded in the Bible in Acts. They're this idol temple right in the center of their city. It, gener it was the generator of the main income of this city. This idol temple, it sustained the city. And so anyone who followed Jesus instead... Like that, that, that was putting all of that at risk. So it was hard ground to be a Christian there, actually. Uh, it, it was contentious. And Paul is writing to these Christians to encourage them and to pray for them in this crazy frontline place. And this part is a prayer and there's gold to be dug for in it. So let's dig, let's read. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you feel a little bit like mind boggled after hearing that, like I'm dyslexic, so whenever when anyone reads a scripture at me, I'm like, well, I didn't take any of that in. Don't worry, we're gonna work through this and break it down. It's gonna be fun. This letter in the Bible is what Paul felt were the key things that these Christians needed to know if they were gonna follow Jesus well in a compromising culture this compromising culture that surrounded them. So, so the point for us today, whether we have been a Christian for like 10 years or for 10 minutes, it, it's the same. The opportunity is we get to ask ourselves, oh, do we really get this truth? Uh, it, or, or, it, or is there more to be grabbed hold, hold of in it for me? And if we actually, we wouldn't call ourselves Christians, here stands a glimpse into what being a Christian looks like. So we just had prayer week and um, last prayer week, which happened a few months before, um, I booked a prayer slot with my little girls. They're, they're twins, they're five. And we prayed for an hour. 
What I mean by that is, is uh, very loosely would hold me to that. What, what that meant was we mainly spent most of the hour drawing unicorns and accidentally set fire to the table because I'd put a candle on. Uh, and then maybe we spent like a couple of minutes praying for their school and their, and their friends. And honestly, it was possibly one of the most discouraging hours of my life until I saw the fruit. The following months, three things happened. One, we saw five school families who have previously given no interest in coming along to St. Peter's before all come along and try out our service. Uh, secondly, um, never has St. Peter's been invited into the girls' school before. Like, we've, we've offered things and they're just not interested. And suddenly, out of the blue, they invite me in with a team to do RE classes with their year threes. And number three, at their birthday party, the girls' birthday party, a, a few months later, after, after this girl, one of the families had come to church, um, the mum came to me and said, oh, um, um, we came to church with you that time. I'm really not religious, but my little girl, she is so into Jesus. Like, how do I get her baptized? Not to mention the excitement in my kids' lives when I said, oh, it's prayer week again. And they were like brimming with excitement. I think mainly because they thought they might get to set fire to the table again. But they were excited about prayer. That messy, chaotic hour, 25 minutes of prayer was so fruitful. And, to, and it, meant, it kind of lent to, led to this avalanche of breakthrough in my little girl's world. It was totally beautiful. Prayer has power. Even if it feels a bit low, lame, and even if it feels like a complete waste of time. Because intentional times of prayer have power because intentional times of prayer are intentional times prioritizing our friendship with Jesus, flames and all. Prayer is powerful because the person to whom we pray is powerful and he gives us power. Verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So first, when we pray, God strengthens us with power. I think prayer is our most underutilized weapon to deepen our faith and to see God's work, God at work in our lives. If your faith is like wavering today or barely there today, like this is for you. If your faith is all right today, this is for you. Because God has way more for us as we lean into our intentionality around prayer. Because prayer is a tool for intimacy with Jesus. When we pray, God strengthens us with power. But have we really seen it? Like, have we tested it? Do we really know it? I have um, this friend called James, and he has this huge scar across his head because he was in a horrible accident when he was a little boy. He was hit by a truck in a road accident. And he, um, his mom was um, with him in intensive care. And every day for three days in intensive care, James was to the, the mom was told, James, James is, is gonna die. He's, he's gonna die. He's gonna die. And because of the intensity of his um, injuries, he spent many days receiving blood transfusions. And his mom, this small salt of the earth, Yorkshire single mom of boys sat there next to his bed, and as the blood transfused in, she would just pray over, over the blood. She, she would pray, Jesus, may this blood give life to my son. And he survived. She prayed, he survived. And he was discharged. And, 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 but the doctors said, oh, but, but he, he probably won't walk again. And then he probably won't talk again. And not only did he make a full recovery, not only does he walk, but he practices kickboxing now. Not only does he talk, not only does he talk, but he has a PhD and is a university principal now. However, 
the blood transfusions that, 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 that this little single mom prayed over as they went into his body, unbeknownst to them, they had been contaminated with other diseases. And it's actually all over the press at the moment. It's, it's awful about these poor patients at this hospital and all of them who, um, who received the, this contaminated blood. But James, though receiving the same blood transfusions, did not contract any illnesses. In all of this, this single mom, what looked like death for her, the death of her son, received the strength and the power to pray. When we pray, God strengthens us with power. But why? Why would God give us power like this? And how? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Paul here grasps the power of love, but, but, but not love as we know it. In our culture, like like Jesus redefines our understanding of love because Jesus is love. Like like the love that we can know is the person. God loves us, as in the the action, the verb, but but God, our God also is love. That nuance, that clarification of understanding, like that changes everything. Because the very nature of our God is Trinity. He is in his very, at his very core, a God of loving relationship. He doesn't just do love, our Jesus is love. And as we pray to Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, the word who was there at the beginning of time when God formed the very foundations of the earth beneath our feet and the galaxies above our heads, the God who formed you and me in our mother's wombs, as we pray to that God, Jesus, we are inviting his very presence to dwell in us through faith. Prayer leads with into, leads us to intimacy with our creator, like, and the purpose of the power, of this power, is an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus. When we pray, God deepens our intimacy with him. Christ dwelling within you which has a very practical overflow for us in our lives. Like God is, like we say, by identity, love, love itself. So to know God, to know this God, to know our loving God is to realize that he has the absolute best for you and me. And his directions for us in our life, they are different from the world's directions for us. Ephesians 4 that we'll look at next week in the series. It includes this instructions for Christian living. But living out a faith that is countercultural, Paul knew well and good when writing this letter in um, Ephesians, he knew this, is only possible to live out this countercultural faith through a profound intimacy with Jesus. Because Jesus strengthens us with power. Because we're gonna need it. Like, we cannot do this on our own. And to live out this distinctively set-apart Christian life is possible even if we feel an absolute million miles away from that right now. Even if we feel super broken and like there's no way, no, discounting yourself, I'm so screwed up, no way, cannot live for Jesus in that way. It is possible now. Paul says, just before this prayer in chapter three, he says, verse eight, I am less than the least of the Lord's people. This grace was given me. Like Paul's aware, like he is the absolute worst. He's he's basically saying, I I, I know what I'm talking about, people. I've screwed up loads. I've screwed up more than any of you. And I need all the grace and the power that I can get. We do not need to earn our salvation, but there should be this like reaction to receiving it. 
a response, a, a life, a desire to be gifted the grace to live out a life for Jesus in response, a life that looks different to the culture that we're in because of who we follow. I don't know if you've noticed, but like, that's why sometimes when like reading the Bible, some of the stuff in the Bible, it may feel a little bit upside down. Like it may feel like super countercultural because God by his very nature is more loving than we can actually get our heads around. Verse 19, this love that surpasses knowledge. We don't take direction from the world because we get to learn it straight from God's word. Last week, Emily, um, she, it was a brilliant talk. Don't miss out. Go back and check it out if you missed it. But Emily last week described how the devil wants us to think that God is there to, to steal our fun and to limit our lives. But the devil is famously known as the deceiver. Like in contrast, our God is truth. Our God is love. The enemy wants to convince us that biblical boundaries for living will absolutely ruin our lives. When in reality, God's boundaries for living come out of this, this love for us that surpasses knowledge. And so we can know in our hearts that his ways promise us strength and power and absolute fullness of life filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So, practically, how do we prepare for next week's talk? Ephesians 4, um, instructions for Christian living, like, like, like lives set apart for Jesus. Thankfully, Ephesians 3 is very practical. We live by, verse 17, being rooted and established in love. Okay. This, this is going to get really messy. This is a tomato plant that my friend Sarah gave me. Hey, I think she dug it out of her garden. Got her hair attached to it. There's my tomato plant. And, and you know, it is pretty uh, feeble. I mean, it's fabulous. It's like full of potential. I'm so excited about the tomatoes that I'm going to get from this. I mean, but it's not going to give me many tomatoes left like that. I think you have to do something with it. But, therefore... When put in, here we go. I never heard this with a microphone, should have done that. But when put in this soil, all the gardeners are like, you should have taken a little pot off. It's a, it's a degradable one. I think it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> when put in this soil full of nutrients and goodness, it has the potential to grow and reap and and. and, and a crop 10 times its size. But it has to be rooted and established in, in a good place, in good soil. To do that, to do that thriving, to do that growing. For us, it is exactly the same. I was going to use a spade, but we won't. We'll use my hands because it's easier. Now, we need in our life to, to, to grow spiritually, to thrive, to, to become as fruitful as we can be. We need to create this habitat of Bible steep prayer, a good soil environment for us to thrive. We need to pour in time with God's loving presence. We get to pour in a soil of biblical truth around our lives, listening to Jesus. Time, oh, there's a worm in there. Oh, my days, see, really good soil. Prayer is really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> time spent with Jesus, listening to Jesus, being with Jesus, establishing this, this prayer-filled habitat all around us, getting familiar with him. A habitat rooted and established in intimacy with him, rooted and established in love. Get the soil off my iPad. And as we invest all of this time scooping around ourselves, this, this habitat of intimacy, this habitat of prayer, a habitat of love, it leads to fruitful flourishing in a way that we wouldn't have it 
if we didn't. We've just been in a week of prayer, like we said. And, and do you know what? Like, my desire is, is that that is just the beginning. My sense is that God is calling us all to a new prayer-filled life rhythm in this church that actually we're just on the, on the precipice of something very exciting. I feel like God is calling us, to, us all here to a reset. God is inviting us to this prayer-filled rhythm of unceasing prayer. Like, like now, don't feel super overwhelmed, we're gonna talk about this, but we're being called into a new season, allowing him to give us strength and power on new levels every moment of every day. There's a book that I just can't recommend highly enough um, that really unpacks this. I'd encourage us all to read it. I mean, I can't imagine the impact if we all did. Um, Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. And, and if you are into media or anything like that, it has a terrible front cover, so feel commissioned to redo this. But this book is beautiful and it is practical and it models this ease to a prayerful life. Like not striving, like we don't need to go sit in a corner in a dark room and stare at the ceiling and pray. I mean, you totally can, but, but God longs for our prayer lives to be so much more than that. God longs for our prayer lives to be increasingly, effortlessly, unceasing, all the time, every minute of every day, because we can't help but include him in every minute of every day, because it's better with him. However... Part of this is re-understanding and redefining what prayer actually is. Like, it's not weird, intense speeches. I mean, it totally can be, but, but it's not. It, it, it's watching a movie and practicing but becoming aware of Jesus with us as we watch it. And afterwards saying, what did you think about that, Lord? Like, Jesus, or is there any way, like, can I see you in it at all? Rooting and establishing ourselves in this loving intimacy, and yes, sometimes using words. Prayer walking every time, anywhere, everywhere we go, on, on the school pickup, on our commute to work, territory taken for Jesus, this paving slab, your kingdom come, your will be done, every moment of every day, and reading the Bible while also praying, oh Jesus, what does this tell me about you? What does this tell me about me? And, and how can I apply this to my life? to live for you, rooted and established in him who is love by scooping up this habitat of prayer all around us. We root and establish ourselves in a lifestyle of love, rooted and establishing ourselves in him who is love. And I grant you, in this very busy and very noisy world, it's gonna take some real shifts of intentionality for us to, to get there. Um, and so you may want to book in some time this week, just some moments to like pause and think, okay, but like how does this apply to me in my life? But it's just practice. Hence the book to recommendation, practice of the presence of God. Scooping this prayer all around ourselves grows us from this little fragile tomato plant into this. Fully grown fruitful, rooted and established plant, fully grown followers of Jesus, spiritual giants of our former miniature selves, fruitful, flourishing. Forgive me if you've um, heard my story before, but uh, when I was born, um, my birth was quite dramatic. My, my mom nearly died giving birth to me. And, and when I did arrive, I was plagued by this um, incessant cough and difficulty breathing and inability to digest anything. And if you can't really breathe and you can't consume milk, you, you deteriorate very quickly as a baby. So um, my parents thought I was gonna die and the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. And so they couldn't help. Um, and so I got very small and very weak very quickly. And my mom, she would just pray. But she didn't have any words to pray. Like, what do you pray? This is just hopeless. So she would just sit holding me with Jesus, practicing 
being with him with me, practicing the presence of God and reading her Bible for strength. And she basically created this, this habitat of unceasing prayer around herself. And it was out of that time that she formed this, this, this trust, this strengthening of faith that is established who she is. And if you meet her, she's a pretty special lady. She surrendered me to God. And she just existed in the sadness with God, with me, watching me die. But as she rooted and established around herself this, this habitat of unceasing prayer, there was this moment where she kissed my head and she realized that my skin tasted um, extra salty. And it was out of that revelation that the doctors were able to diagnose me with cystic fibrosis and treatment began. And my childhood was made up of doctors, medications, nebulizers, endless physio and sputum pots and grossness. And my parents leaned into church and this group of old ladies leaned into them and said, we are gonna commit to praying for me, for your little girl, every day. And some of those old ladies are still alive and for all I know, they're still praying. And at every stage of my life, the doctors said to my parents, you know, she may make it to 10. She may make it to 12. 16, she may make it to 18. And at every stage of my life, there's been this like expiration date spoken over me. And my parents just kept going and these old ladies, they just kept praying. And until two years ago, my life expectancy, the average life expectancy for someone like me was 36.6 years old. I'm now 37. Come on, come on. And this, this miracle drug has now been released that has exponentially increased my life expectancy even more. Like I could live old enough now to see my grandkids grow up. Like, Unbelievable, that was never even a dream for me. That was never even an option for me to dream about. Such is the power of prayer, intimacy with Jesus, him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. And I remember walking to school as a child and this, this, just this constant awareness of the presence and the power and the love of Jesus filling my heart through faith. I was literally a walking, talking reality of this scripture being true. That is the power. That is what prayer does. And I remember my youth leader saying to me like, oh, do you pray? And, and I always said, yeah. What I meant was, yes, unceasingly. Like prayer was my, 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 my superpower. As an early teen, I, I rarely remember a moment where Jesus was not with me. In everything, literally everything, my life was so saturated in prayer, a habitat of prayer. And if your kids are grown up and they don't know Jesus, I want you to be encouraged today because most of those prayers were not my prayers. Most of those prayers were spoken over me, around me and for me. But in terms of my like lame prayers, like I had no choice. Like there was this dependency on Jesus that I had, I just utter dependence on him. Like every infection, I cried out to him. Every sleepless night, all those hours on the loo, every embarrassing moment when my body just would not work as it should work, I cried out to him. Jesus was with me in it. So just like Paul, I wanna pray over you. I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Amen. Um, as, as you're able, shall we stand? I think we should probably do it, <laughs> a bit of this praying.
And I'm looking around and seeing all these faces who've prayed for me when I get sick now and just so grateful for all of you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Lord, I thank you for this call over this church that you are calling us to a, to a, a, a shift. a new life rhythm for each and every one of us of unceasing prayer. And, and I think there's some people in the room, your heart really pounds when I say that. For others, it doesn't. This is for all of us. So don't worry how you're feeling. Holy Spirit, I thank you for what you, what you do. How if we feel dry and a bit like, oh, apathetic, actually, we can ask you to make us care more, to make us want more intimacy with you. You even do that. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for us on the cross. Separating our sin from us as far as the east is from the west, that you qualify us and then you rose from the dead so that we can have life and life in all of its fullness, the fullness of the measure of God. And then you don't stop there. Then you gift us this strength and this power to walk this life out. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us hunger for an intimacy with you and every moment with you because it's more fun that way. So Holy, Spirit's enlar Holy Spirit, enlarge our hearts today. Fill us with your love and your strength and your power today. May you increase our faith today. I pray for a real gift of faith now, Jesus, just settling on the room. People realizing afresh the power and authority they have when they talk to you just because they're being with you. And Lord, we thank you that you have more. And we just say sorry now together collectively for if we have capped you, if we have thought, oh, this is it, this is what it is being a Christian and there's no more, there is always more to be had of following Jesus. There is always more. And we thank you for your grace that rests upon us.